rise and face the processional cross.
On this most holy day, we come to this place to behold our God, Father, Son, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is what the Lord says. What have I done to you, O my people? And where have I offended you? Answer me. I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death, and you delivered your Redeemer to be scourged. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you nailed your Savior to the cross. Holy God, holy, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. This is what the Lord says. What have I done to you, O my people, and where have I offended you? Answer me. I have conquered all your foes and delivered you from your enemies, and you gave me over to be persecuted. I fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink. Holy God, holy, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. This is what the Lord says. What have I done to you, O my people? And where have I offended you? Answer me. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Is this how you thank your God, O my people? Holy God, <laughs> holy and mighty, holy and wonderful, have mercy on us. Almighty God, graciously behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death on the cross. Amen. 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 Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who shall believe what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, 
and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. While he was a chastisement that brought us peace, and in his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall proclaim, his, prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, 
he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Jesus stood there in silence. His people in the court raged with accusation after accusation after accusation against him. When he was asked to answer the charges, our Lord pled the fifth well before the fifth was even a thing in law. The charges, of course, were baseless, false, twisted, but the truth remained silent. Why would he not answer? His silence spoke volumes. His silence would surely condemn him, but his condemnation would be our salvation. Good Friday encompasses the silence of God, even as it focuses on our salvation on the cross purchased and won through us in Christ. Oftentimes on Good Friday, <coughs> pastors will think about preaching from the seven last words of our Lord and there is indeed something powerful for us to consider in each one of them. But this evening, I invite you to consider that silence says infinitely more that day. And so here today, you and I, on this Good Friday, are in this place, still and silent before the mystery of a crucified God. On Good Friday, we embrace the silence of God for our salvation. We contemplate the final sacrifice as he stands before the awestruck Pontius Pilate like a lamb that is silent before his shearer. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges are brought against you. But as St. Mark records, Jesus made no answer. His silence is profound. Here is God, put on trial by his creation, the creator standing accused before the very things in which he created. And he says nothing. 
here once and for all, God hears the accusations of all of humanity and says nothing in his own defense. He refuses to speak for himself so that he may justify each and every one of you with his silence. His silence is not for his sake, but yours and mine. And so it's worthy of us contemplating it on this most holy evening. You see, whenever there is a horrific event, whether it's caused by weather, as recently it was with the storms across the Midwest, or whether it was an event caused by another human, and those are too numerous for me to even list, oftentimes as a pastor, as a Christian, I feel as if I need to defend God. Where was God when? Why did God allow? Why didn't God stop? Good Friday invites me, invites us, to remember that we dare not speak when and where God remains silent. And while I feel that our Lord may need defending, against the accusations we bring against him. Good Friday reminds me that he does not. Trying to make the incomprehensible mystery of God comprehensible, I will fail. No matter the amount of theological education or philosophical knowledge I may possess. Attempting to justify God as if he has to answer for evil, pain, and suffering this world is to make God speak when he remains silent. After all, no one likes words put in their mouth. For a God whom we can fully comprehend in every infinite detail is a God subject to our finite reason and no longer God. To explain away this mystery is indeed to explain away God himself. We may bring all of the problems in our world, all of the evil before him, and try to make him answer for it. But that is exactly what the events of Good Friday did. All of the evil of the world, past, present, future, from the moment <coughs> time began to the moment <coughs> time ended, was launched at our Lord that day. And he responded in deafening silence. Admittedly, this silence is frustrating. It's infuriating. And at times saddening when we are faced with so much evil and suffering in this world. Our news confronts us daily. Child slavery, abuse, war, plague, cancer, murder, hate. This world knows its fair share of all of these things and more. We see evil and we feel the need to call it out. And we call out to God, but too often our prayers seem to go unanswered. God's silence is deafening. But it is precisely this silence we see on Good Friday that should make us pause in dumbstruck awe along with Pontius Pilate. God's silence in the face of the evil of this world is so profound. It's as if you could hear the pin dropping from a grenade in the middle of a battle. It was a battle, after all. Because this very silence, the very silence, that very silence, becomes our salvation on the cross. For it is there on the cross that Jesus Christ, very God of very God, light of light, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and our salvation came to earth. And he wrestled. Jesus, the Son of God, wrestled with the silence of God in the face 
of evil for all of humanity. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This cry of Jesus from the cross was first uttered long before our Lord ever spoke it in Psalm 22. Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find no rest. Yet, you are holy. It is strange that the word of God here in Psalm 22 should affirm our accusation of God's silence. But that's what the psalm does and invites us to do. Jesus cites this word of God as the word of God. This psalm, as he's there on the cross, precisely when God is silent in the face of the greatest evil this world will ever know, his very own death. However, this is not a cry of unbelief, nor is it an ungodly accusation. Rather, Jesus affirms that God is holy, even in his silence. On the cross, God is done talking. Instead, he delivers once and for all salvation in silence. Here in death, God unites himself with us to enter the eternal silence that he might shatter the gates of hell with a whisper at the mouth of the cave in his resurrection. And in his resurrection, it is that he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. This Friday, as we ponder the cross, silent and still, we look upon the mystery of our salvation, Christ Jesus suffering for you and for me in silence against all the accusations against all the evil he suffered for you but that silence was not his last word amen Now we bring our offerings before the Lord, the gifts that God's people have brought tonight.
Passion Gospel, Part 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you speak? seek? And they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken, Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of that man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. <coughs> Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said was wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed.
The Passion Gospel, Part 2. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put, put it on his head and <coughs> arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews and struck him with their hands. <clears throat> Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivers me over to you has the greater sin.
Passion Gospel, Part 3. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in, Ara in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They delivered my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Gospel Passion, Part 4. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, it to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, when, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there.
O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, hear us. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we beseech you to hear us. O Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Cry. 